The following programme is made possible by the friends and partners of Creation Today. In the beginning. Whatever comes to your mind when you hear those three words is probably going to determine how you think about genetic editing. That's our conversation today. You see what was considered just science fiction just a few years ago is becoming modern day reality. Uh, recent advantages or advances, excuse me, in genetics are both um, exciting and they're, I got to admit, a little bit terrifying. It's been about 20 years since we completed the Human Genome Project, allowing us to see the blueprint of life. And now we have the ability to slice out preferred genetic information from one set of instructions and paste them into another set of instructions. And well, with this ability, some scientists just can't resist tinkering with our instruction manual. Well, as you can imagine, this brings up all kinds of moral questions for scientists. And if you believe in the beginning means that God created all of life and God created our genetic information, then you have to filter these new possibilities through another lens. Just because it's doable, is it biblically moral? Uh, this is going to be a great conversation, and I am so glad you are here to experience this conversation with me. Welcome to the Creation Today Show, where we bring together interviews with experts and solid Bible teaching. Your host, Eric Hovind, affirms the ultimate authority of God's Word, the truth of creation, and why it matters to you. If you are joining me via Facebook or YouTube, or you're listening to the awesome Creation Today podcast, or maybe you're watching from one of our partner television stations, I want to say a sincere thank you uh, for peeking into our community of individuals who just want to be discipled with science and scripture. Our mission here is really simple. We want to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones on people's journey to know Christ. So if you've ever wanted to join a community, uh, come on over to creationtoday.org and partner with us. Your partnership uh, gives you access to everything we are doing, and it lets you interact with our guests here on the show. Hey, to all my Creation Today partners, thank you guys uh, for hanging out with us. Lisa and Kevin and Jim and Gary and Dennis, PK, all of you guys, thanks for hanging out. Uh, if you want, go ahead and start in the chat letting me know what you think about genetic editing, okay? Because after I introduce my, my guest, I want to read some of your thoughts because I know several of you have already reached out and you've said you're really looking forward to this conversation, and I am too, okay? My guest today is none other than the amazing Dr. Georgia Purdom. Her PhD is in molecular genetics from Ohio State University. And today, along with researching and writing and speaking for Answers in Genesis, Dr. Purdom is the Director of Educational Content for Answers in Genesis. And many of you will remember that she was one of our experts in the film Genesis Paradise Lost. I think it's safe to say she's got a lot on her plate. So uh, Dr. Purdom, thank you so much for taking time to be on the Creation Today show with us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Eric. Hey, I want to give you an update real quick to start. Several years ago, you braved a winter storm in order to come to the Creation Museum where you work and do an interview for Genesis Paradise Lost. And the film now, I just wanted to update you, it's been translated into 31 languages. It's been distributed wow. to 112 countries, and we've sold more than 150,000 copies worldwide. So that, along with what you guys do at Answers in Genesis, which literally blows my mind, uh, it's just amazing to see all that God is doing with your life. Uh, truly remarkable. We, as a ministry, just want to say thank you for being willing to use your life uh, by God. Or let God use your life for his glory. We really appreciate the work that you do. Well, thanks for letting me be a part of that film. You know, it's just great to see the impact um, that it's had, that it has on our guests here at the Creation Museum as they watch it um, in a special effects uh, 4D theater that we have. And um, and I noticed too, when you showed the clip, I'm like, I looked a lot younger than as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been a couple of years, I got to admit. I think I had a, had a slightly skinnier face back then. <laughs> hey, we've got a really interesting topic today, genetic editing. And I was... I'm almost, 
I don't know where I'm at, to be honest, but with your degree in molecular genetics, um, I figured this is the perfect topic for you. And I thought I might as well ask you to start with, you think Ken is going to let you tinker around with some of the uh, animals there and their genetics at the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum? You guys could have a true one of a kind there that people would come see. What do you think? Uh, I don't think he's going to let me do that. And I'm not sure that I would want to do that. Um, you know, it, it's not that easy. A lot of times I think when we hear about these types of technologies, it might sound relatively simple what they're saying, but the reality is that it's very, very complex and we're still very much in the early stages of this. Well, that's what I would love for you to kind of get us up to speed on the whole genetics process. Uh, maybe you could kind of start with giving us a little history if you think that's a good place to start, but I, I really am. I'm sitting here as a student today going, help. I know that some crazy things have been, have, have happened, uh, that, that blow my mind, but where, where were we and where are we at and where do you think we're going? Okay. That's, that's a big question. So yeah. let me start with a little bit of, a little bit of history. So really okay. genetics as a science hasn't been around all that long um, because it is so um, challenging. You can't just look through a light microscope and see DNA. Um, that's just not possible. And um, so really the first time that we kind of see genetics coming into play or developing as a science is Gregor Mendel, you know, back in the um, uh, 1800s, the mid to late 1800s with his pea plants and figuring out that certain traits were inherited um, and, and doing some of the genetics on that, but he didn't really know what the molecule of heredity was. Um, he knew that, that obviously offspring could inherit from their parents and they did so in certain, a certain fashion. They came up with certain laws, so to speak, um, within genetics, but he didn't really know what, what was the molecule that did that. Um, and so that took a lot more experiments throughout the early 1900s to really nail down that it was DNA. Um, but even then, we still didn't know what DNA looked like, right? What was the structure of DNA? And that wasn't until the early 1950s when Watson and Crick first published their paper showing the actual structure of DNA. So when you think about it, it really hasn't, I mean, it's really only been in the last 70 or so years that we've even known about this, the um, structure of DNA. And then it wasn't until 2000 that we first even sequenced a human genome. Uh, so I know it was right, right as I graduated and got my PhD that they had figured out the human genome. And I, in fact, just saw a paper today where even 22 years later, they, they said we finally actually sequenced every single base in the human genome. Because even though we came out with a, a sequence for it, there were still parts of it that are hard to sequence. And so we're just now, so this, this is where we're at. So what I'm saying is this is all very new technology, very new information um, that we're still dealing with as a whole when it comes to genetics. So well, I'm, I'm curious, some of the things I've seen, I saw them, you know, back in 2002, genetically take, was it two that they actually took the, the glow uh, gene from a jellyfish and put it into mice. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, I, I had a, had a slide on that. Let me show you this. This is, this is crazy. They've actually, there it is. Yeah. They genetically modified mice where they're actually glowing. They've genetically modified chickens to have no feathers. They've genetically modified pigs to have more, like double this, the amount of meat on pigs. And they just got FDA approval this year to uh, introduce genetically modified cows that have like a shorter uh, hair length and it's called silk cows where they're, they're, they're literally able to live in hotter climates easier. And so I thought, wow, what a, we're doing some really, interesting things what's possible with this like okay they introduced CRISPR. anyway what's i'm seeing all this and it's honestly it scared me years ago i'm like this is wrong you guys are messing around with god's you know genetic engineering i got rodney on here saying hey i'm against genetic engineering as a diabetic both, both my wife and i are taking insulin and i go yeah rodney you know they genetically modified insulin back in the 80s to be able to produce probably the insulin that you're on so <laughs> so I think, I think like with anything, I think we have to be careful because just because it can be used for maybe, um, and it can seem scary. We have to think about that 
um, there can be good uses and there can be bad uses for anything. It's just like dynamite. Okay. It can be used to blow something up so we can build something else, or it can be used to blow up people. So, I mean, those are, those are two very different things. And one is a very good use and one is a very bad use. So I don't think genetic engineering or genetic editing in and of itself is evil. Um, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So, so we just have to figure out how to use it well. Um, and like the animals that you were talking about, um, they're of course genetically edited in different ways um, and they've, that they've been able to develop these. Um, sometimes it's through even mutations that they've discovered that they've made in these animals that like, I don't know specifically on each of those. Um, obviously with the glow in the dark mice, so to speak, um, that's the ability to put a particular gene in, like you said, and have them express it. Um, but in other cases, it could just be that they've made mutations so that like maybe, and again, I don't know, but the chicken doesn't have feathers. Okay. So you know, th there can be some good uses, um, like on the, the cow that you were talking about. And even when you were talking about insulin, there are genetically modified organisms like bacteria that produce the human insulin that diabetics need. So there are some really good uses for genetic engineering, um, I think. But I think when it comes to CRISPR, which you mentioned, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, that is the newest in genetic, specifically in genetic editing, not just genetic engineering, which is sort of a broad term, but genetic editing and being able to specifically go into uh, the genome of an organism and make a very specific change. Um, so do you want me to give you some background on CRISPR and how all this came to be? Yes, please okay. do. This is okay. fascinating to me. So CRISPR was um, first kind of the whole system, it actually comes from bacteria. So I don't know if most people understand that, but the CRISPR-Cas9 system, it comes from bacteria and they use it as part of their immune system. So it might seem kind of weird that bacteria have an immune system, but they get infected with viruses just like we do. And so this is a way for them to sort of fight back against those viruses. Um, so they use it in a, in, a, in a way. And that was discovered probably back in like the late 80s. Um, that was first discovered, but it wasn't until like 2012 um, that they first, so 10 years ago, that they first said, okay, we can actually take that system that they have, that God has designed those bacteria to have, and we can utilize it in a way to make genetic changes, very specific, precise genetic changes in organisms. Okay. So, so that was basically the um, idea behind it. And so it sort of acts like basically what it does, and there's different versions of this, okay, so I'm not describing every version of CRISPR-Cas9 that's out there, because they've modified it, they've, you know, they can do different things to it, but the basic idea is that it's a, it's a pair of molecular scissors that goes in and cuts out a very specific piece of DNA, so it has like a, a guide molecule on it, so it knows where to go in the DNA, it makes a specific cut, and then it either replaces it with what it wants, what, what the person has engineered it to put in, or sometimes natural repair will just occur and the organism will have a, a change as a result of that. So there's a couple, and there's even more versions than that, um, but that's the basic idea. The basic idea is to go in and cut out or make a modification in um, a very specific part of the DNA. And that's why this particular system is so um, celebrated because it's so specific. Because before a lot of the genetic engineering was taking place using viruses to go in and infect cells and try to make changes, which has a whole host of issues, which sadly have resulted even in the death of individuals from reacting to the viruses. So this gets around that. Um, so we're not having to use viruses to do it. Um, and so we can use these, um, this particular system to be able to try to modify the DNA in a very specific way. So it, my understanding of DNA is the way it's wound up and everything is when you think about it, uh, this is from uh, Jay Seeger that came on and did a program with me on, on DNA. And he said, what's fascinating about DNA is you got, you can read it forwards and backwards. And then he talked about how it's actually three dimensional. How comfortable are you with what scientists are doing, knowing the complexities? Are, are we, are, are we, thinking that we have this figured out and we may not, or is it, no, I think we're, we really do have a knowledge base that is, that is competent to slice, dice, put together, you know, these different things that we're doing. Any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think it, 
I think it's okay to be doing this at a certain level. Now, when we talk about, let's exclude humans from this for right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's just talk about animals. We There is the dominion mandate given in Genesis. We are to have dominion over organisms. And I think some of that can be in genetically modifying them or engineering them to serve our purposes. Now, we still have to be careful with that, obviously. I mean, anytime, especially if it's a wild animal or something and you're leaving it out into um, an ecosystem, it could affect other organisms. It could, you know, how does that play out in the ecosystem in which it lives in um, or the or the area that it lives in? So those are things we definitely have to be careful of. Um, but I don't think um, it's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, to be able to make very precise changes is pretty cool. Um, and so I think that's a good thing. Now, as far as applying that to human beings, I think it can be a good thing too. Obviously, this is a way to reverse the curse or mitigate the effects of the curse. And that's a good thing. So for some diseases, we know very specifically what causes that disease in the DNA. Um, there are certain mutations associated with, say, cystic fibrosis. Um, it's not necessarily just one. There's there's several, but we we can sequence someone's genome. And we can know that's what's causing most likely their cystic fibrosis. So there are. So I think it could be used for good in repairing those genes and in making them function again properly. I think the real issue comes. Well, there's two issues. One, does it have any off-target effects? Okay, so does it just do what it's supposed to do, which is change that particular gene in that particular place, or is it doing other things while it's in there? Okay, that that's a, that's a big overriding question. And number two, can that change be passed on to future generations? So the only way it can be passed on to future generations of an individual is if that change is taking place in the embryo at a very, very early stage in embryonic development. So they would have to be doing it as a part of like IVF, in vitro fertilization, and making those changes in the embryo. And so, um, so that so, because if you make that change, then all the the sperm or the egg that individual produces will have that change, presumably. And, and so then you are passing whatever the CRISPR did, you're passing it on to future generations. And so right now in the United States, there is a moratorium on that. You cannot, you cannot do that. So you cannot genetically modify a human being in a dish, so to speak, and then um, have a woman become pregnant with that child. Okay. That is, that is not allowed in the United States. Now, unfortunately, it's not that way in other countries. And so China, back in 2018, um, there was a scientist, and this made the headlines, and so probably a lot of people are familiar with it, that supposedly had done this to um, fraternal twins uh, that a woman did give birth to, and then also a third child, which was given birth to by another set of parents. And so that he made these changes. He was actually trying to modify... A, um, a gene called CCR5, such that these children would be um, immune from getting HIV infected. Um, so they would, know, they would not be able to have AIDS. Uh, so that's what he was trying to do. The thing is, um, it didn't really work. Um, it did make modifications to that gene, but not the specific modifications that he wanted. And it made different modifications in each of the twins. So so that that's that's why it should not be used in in humans that to the extent that they're going to pass it on to future generations like that um now that being said all right i think that's very very problematic and he went to jail for that okay wow. so so he served prison time i believe he just got out but he served several years of prison time for that and that is very problematic but there is a lot of ongoing research clinical trials with CRISPR that are just changing the individual cells of a person, not their sperm or their eggs. So they're just making changes in the adult. I have no, I have no issues with them doing that as long as they're trying to do it in a safe way, because obviously like I just saw a paper today where they said they're using CRISPR Cas9 to try to help individuals who have um, herpes virus eye infections. Okay. There's no good way to treat that. And so they're trying to basically use CRISPR to cut out the virus. So it doesn't 
cause the problem, okay, in the eyes. Um, they're also using it to restore vision loss in, con in congenital retinal disease. Okay, so these are things that these individuals, they have no hope. There's no type of treatment. And so they're using them to try, they're using it in these clinical trials to help these individuals. They're not going to pass it on to the next generation. And it may only be the only treatment that they can ever get for this. So I think, you know, that those can be some good uses for it. Um, but like I say, when we go around playing around with children like this and not knowing what the long-term impacts of that are going to be, and then not even making the changes you specifically wanted, it, it rings, definitely rings some alarm bells. Well, that it, it brings up to me the idea that Jesus in scripture healed people. You know, he did literal miracles. So, you know, I, I, I would imagine a skeptic now going, I wonder if he just knew something about DNA and he was, he was pulling a CRISPR, you know, <laughs> like what was going on there. But he, he did miracles. He healed the blind. He made the lame walk. Um, um, Amber is, uh, is, she does little video clips for us, takes these and turns it into little video clips. And she's, she's on the program today and, and uh, she has uh, SMA uh, and her disability is from a, a, a mutation on chromosome five. And I'm sure she's sitting there. Well, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for you. Maybe, maybe once we kick uh, Facebook and YouTube off, you can jump on and talk to us. But I, uh, I mean, going, okay, this is the way God made me, but what if something mm -hmm. could change? I, I think she's, I'll let her tell us about that afterwards. But anyway, she suffers right now from SMA and, and uh, another friend of ours that used to help us here uh, was, was, or has cystic fibrosis. And I go, if this is something that can help in the healing process, I mean, we're all trying to get back to the perfect world, right? We're all in this sin cursed world. We're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. We want that health, that 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 slowest possible rate of dying health. Um, we want that in our lives. And so it's hard to look at somebody who's suffering from a disease and go, yeah, we shouldn't be doing any genetic modification, even if it does help you. I go, Man, personally, I'm kind of like, I kind of would, yeah, I think if I was going blind from something, I would, I would want something that could help that. So I see the good from it. Um, I also see, as Gary says uh, in the chat, one of our members, he said it can be helpful, but the concern is who's going to be regulating what yeah. and sh what should be done. I mean, in a society where godly morals are no longer the criteria for our behavior, we can't control uh, negative and damaging uses of this ability. So where does our worldview come into genetic editing? Yeah. And I think, I think we have to, as Christians, um, we do have to think about those things. I mean, we don't have control over it from a, I mean, most of the, most of the scientists working on this probably are not Christians. They don't have a biblical worldview. They don't see anything wrong with even experimenting on um, what are essentially little tiny babies in a dish. I mean, you know, and then throwing those out. I mean, that's already happened with CRISPR where they've experimented even here in the U S that part is allowed sadly. Um, and so, uh, so I would say anything obviously that takes the life of an individual should not be done. Um, you know, any type of, of, um, embryonic, uh, stem cells or embryonic, you know, using embryos to test these things is definitely a wrong thing because it's killing it ultimately results in the death of these individuals. Not that the, the process did it, but then they're throwing them out afterwards because they're not allowing them to be implanted. So I think that's the number one criteria is to preserve life, um, even the unborn life. Um, so we have to do that. And I think too, we have to look at, you know, is, you know, some people talk about playing God well, but we do, I mean, I don't see why this is how this is different fundamentally from saying, even going in and doing surgery on an, on a child in the womb. How is it fundamentally different from uh, doing something even out, you know, like me, I don't hear well. And so I had to have a cochlear implant. All right. So there's electrodes implanted into my head that allows me to hear. So I don't see how it's fundamentally different from those things. Um, and so those are good things and good ways to be able to mitigate the effects of the curse in a fallen world. Um, but when it goes to either killing life or when it goes to um, it being passed on to future generation, then I think we have to draw the line and we have to say, that's not somewhere we're willing to go, especially when, and there's, there's been some other papers that have come out recently that showed that CRISPR is having off target effects. Mm -hmm. So that is a concern of mine 
um, with this particular technique. And we need to do more research on it. And we need to, we need to really carefully look at that. So it's not quite slicing and putting in exactly what we think or what we're trying to do every time. And when you have those kind of, you know, quote mutations or those kind of uh, side effects, I guess you'll say where it cuts and splices or does something it's not supposed to and targets something that you weren't intending. We don't know what the outcome is. I mean, we are kind of left in the dark. I, I looked at the, um, I should have put these slides in there. They have the human chromosomes mapped out one through 26 and then the X and the Y, and they show all the different places where they know a mutation here causes this disease mutation here causes this disease. And, and first of all, it, it, it flies in the face of evolution that says mutations cause evolution to happen. All we see is these mutations. It's like, these are the diseases that we know about. These aren't even the ones that track the people that died because we never got to figure it out. So not, not including the deadly ones, we're not seeing these beneficial mutations, but when it comes to the line, you said, okay, killing human life is a line being passed down to the next generation would be a line because now you, you don't know how many people you're affecting when you right. do something in the embryonic stage that is going to affect their children and their children's children and, and, and so on. Are there any other like lines in the sand that we should be thinking through from a Christian worldview? Yeah. I mean, I think the other line that we think about obviously with this is eugenics. And so where yes. is it going to stop? I mean, obviously in curing disease is a good thing. And I don't think anyone's going to argue that you shouldn't cure disease, but where does that, where does that stop? You know, well, I I'm not happy with my, my height or I'm not happy with my, you know, whatever it might be. Now, I don't think in adults, we don't really think about that because I mean, once you, once you're grown, you're probably not going to be able to change your height through genetic editing. It's just probably not going to happen. Okay. Your bones aren't going to be able to probably handle that and do that and, and grow and change. So I think the eugenics concern is more of a concern for at the embryonic stage where they would be making changes, not just to cure disease, which would, you know, again, I'm not saying that we couldn't do that at some point, but I am saying that right now I, I cannot see that because it does appear to be making off target effects. So that that's my concern with that right now. But the question was, even if we could, even if we decided, okay, well, if we can just cure this one thing and fix this one thing, then that's okay. Even at the embryonic embryonic stages, but then where does it stop? You know, are we going to, I mean, probably a lot of people, I don't know how, how old your audience is, but I remember the movie Gattaca with yes. Ethan Hawke and Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. And if, if you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's an older movie, but a lot of the things in that movie, it just, it feels like very relevant to today um, because in that society, they decide, they pick and choose, so to speak, the traits that they want. So obviously, just like with anything, it goes further than just curing disease and that becomes the problem. And then you have eugenics, which means well-born or good in birth, and you have individuals selecting for or against certain traits and um, and then who pays for that? And do we prejudice against people who don't have that done? And, you know, it, it, it has a, it can have very catastrophic effects, just like it did in the early 1900s when people weren't doing it on a genetic basis, but they were doing it on the outcomes, you know, the, the traits, so to speak, that people showed. I, was, I threw some slides in here just on that because I was so curious about that. The, the eugenics movement, they, they actually were trying to say, we want perfect people to breed with perfect, perfect people to try to rid out any kind of mental retardation, things like that. And they were actually encouraging in the schools, teaching this in the schools, they would have, um, here's why we Americans should be careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle, and then leave ancestry of our children to chance. Oh, we shouldn't do that. Like we're, we care about these things. So they literally had clubs and meetings and a, an entire movement on creating people that were were fit. And then right. of course, Hitler took that to a whole nother level saying, well, Hey, why don't we, and again, this was on an evolution worldview. Why don't we rid the world of the lesser species, the lesser races so that we can continue to evolve. So the world has seen the, the bad very clearly of a eugenics type idea. And it seems to me like there's already people wondering, well, Hey, can we take the genetics of Einstein's intelligence? and the athleticism of a Michael Jordan and the, can we, can we, can we, can we do what the movie twins did? Can we try to create this concoction and get this, you know, perfect human being? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think and I think that's the thing that has to be on everyone's mind as as we sort through these things and think about these things. And even in, you know, when we we think about policies that are being created and regulations, and then it comes down to you know voting for people that are going to you know I mean regulate some of these things and and have a say in those regulations. We may not be able to do anything on a personal level, but we definitely can at the level of who we vote into office and really thinking wisely about that and where they stand on these different issues. Because even you think about, when we think about genetic eugenics, um, there's like, there was a genetic anti-discrimination act passed years ago that you can't discriminate um, or against someone on the basis of genetics for things like life insurance and all of that. So as we get more technologically savvy, I mean, like I say, there's always, there's a lot of great things I think with it. And I don't want people to just think that it's inherently bad, even genetic screening to test for genetic errors, I think can be a really good thing, but we can also see how it could be used in a very bad way too. So I think we just have to be watching where it's going, how it's going, and then thinking about how do we play a role in um, even with um, elected certain people or um, speaking against certain people or whatever it might be and, and making our voice heard when it comes to these issues and what we need to think about. I'm going to have to let Facebook and YouTube go. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining me. If you want to catch more of this conversation, please come over to creationtoday.org and just partner with us for whatever you want and uh, be, be part of the conversation. And you're going to interact with our guests. We sure love that. I just want you to know I'm about to ask Dr. Purdom about probably one of the main things that people use as evidence for evolution. It's what converted uh, a friend of mine who's an atheist named Paul Inns uh, on YouTube, runs a channel called Paulogia, just interviewed him a couple weeks ago. It's what uh, took uh, Rhett and Link, uh, they were the most popular YouTube channel in the world and caused them to say, I don't think Christianity is true anymore. I no longer believe the Bible, evolution is true. All because of human chromosome number two. I wanna ask her about that and the genetics that's, that's actually going on there and a little bit more on the, this morality line. I mean, because we have this ability, how far do we go? I appreciate what you guys have already heard. Here's some lines in the sand. Don't kill human life. Uh, don't don't have it be something that affects you don't know how many people down the line. So we've got a couple lines in the sand uh, that I love, and I hope that that's helpful for you. Uh, you can join us each week here at noon uh, live, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and to our creation today uh, watchers on television and on our podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next week. By the way, next week is going to be a great conversation. I'm talking to somebody who was a former atheist turned pastor and getting his, his story here. Like what, what did it take to go from atheism to belief in God and then Christianity and then a desire to not only leave atheism, but actually teach people not to be atheists. It's going to be a great conversation. You're going to love that one. Thank you guys for joining us. Dr. Verdum, probably number one of the number one things that people use to leave the, the Christian worldview that